In this tutorial, we're going to deepen our understanding of homeostasis by focusing on one specific area, and that is thermoregulation or temperature control. The first aim is can you describe the structure of the skin, one of the key effectors in temperature control? Then can you explain the negative feedback pathway in terms of temperature regulation? Then can you explain why we must control body temperature? Why is it important? Okay, so let's start off the tutorial with an interesting idea, which is how much temperature do you think the human body can withstand? In 1775, Charles Blagden, secretary of the Royal Society, entered a room heated by a furnace to around 127 degrees Celsius. With him, he took his pet dog, some colleagues, as well as a raw steak and some raw eggs. Now remember, the temperature was 127 degrees Celsius, that's 27 degrees Celsius above the boiling temperature of water. How long do you think he survived? Remarkably, he and his team survived for 8 minutes unharmed. During this time, his heart rate had doubled, but his core temperature remained about the same, around 37 degrees Celsius. The steak was well cooked, the eggs were cooked hard, yet Charles Blagden was completely okay. In fact, his dog, once he had foot protection, remained in there for an extra 22 minutes. That's half an hour in a 127 degrees Celsius heated room. So the key to understanding this seemingly miraculous event is our understanding of thermoregulation. So let's start off by looking at our skin or the structure of our skin as it's one of the key effectors that help us regulate temperature. So we're going to start by looking at the skin in cross section. Now the skin may look simple to you, but there's a lot going on. In fact, if you want to see what life is like without functioning skin, Google search a very rare condition called Harlequin's disease, but be warned, the images are quite disturbing. So first of all, you may have realized that your skin is embedded with tiny hairs, and these hairs are controlled by erector muscles, which contract to basically pull the hair up, like raising a flag, and relax to allow the hair to lie flat on the surface of the skin. I'm sure you're also aware that your skin has the ability to produce sweat and that's because you have a sweat gland. So this is another effector because it's a gland. We have sweat glands which produce sweat which is deposited on the surface of our skin. We also have thermoreceptors, in other words nerve endings which can detect changes in temperature. Also located near every hair you'll find a sebaceous gland, sebaceous gland, and sebaceous glands produce a grease or oil called sebum. That's why if you don't wash for a few days your actual skin will become quite greasy. Now interestingly enough this sebum does have a very important function. The bacteria that live in your skin, the millions of bacteria that live in your skin, feed on this sebum. That's why when a body dies it decays very quickly because it stops producing sebum so the bacteria start to break down your tissue instead. And finally, there are obviously blood vessels that run through the skin as well. This is why your skin can sometimes have a reddish puffy appearance when you've done exercise, shall we say, as blood flows closer to the surface of the skin. And also when you're cold, you don't look so red and puffy. Actually, your skin looks quite pale as blood basically runs deeper down. And that is how you can describe the structure of the skin. Now we're going to look at the negative feedback pathway for thermoregulation or temperature control. If you remember from my homeostasis overview tutorial, I said there were four key steps to any negative feedback pathway. The stimulus, that's the change within the body. The receptor, the part of the body that detects the change. The effector, that's the most important part, the parts of the body that actually do something to bring about the response. Now the response is the reversal of the initial change. So the response brings about negative feedback, a reversal of the change. So let's say the first stimulus is our body temperature rises above 37 degrees Celsius, perhaps because we're exercising or it's a very hot day. Now the receptor, the part of the body that detects that change, there are in fact two in thermoregulation. The first one is a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, hypothalamus. Now my science teacher used to tell me that it's the part of the brain that basically tastes the blood and checks it for various things like body temperature. Now that image always stuck in my head for some reason so I've drawn a brain with a tongue here dipping its tongue into the blood checking the temperature. The hypothalamus is sort of centrally located at the base. But you also have thermoreceptors in your skin which receive information from the external environment and send that information to the brain. 
But just remember, the receptors are hypothalamus and skin for whether your temperature goes up or down. It's always the same. So now let's look at the most mark-worthy part, the effectors or the role of the effectors. So remember, our body temperature has gone up above 37 degrees Celsius. What's going to bring it down? The first important thing is something called vasodilation. That means blood vessel dilation. Dilation is when something gets wider in a circular manner, like your pupils dilate. So imagine blood is flowing down this blood vessel here. Now you're getting hot. So you need that blood containing all that heat to transfer that heat to the environment. To do that, it needs to get closer to the surface of the skin. So vasodilation occurs when these muscles around the blood vessels relax. And this allows blood to flow closer to the surface of the skin where heat can be lost through radiation because it's not as hot outside, it's hotter inside. So there's a temperature gradient set up so heat will move to where it's colder. But you don't need to say any of that. All you need to say is vasodilation, which says it all. And you must remember the process of heat loss, which is radiation. This is when heat escapes the body as infrared waves. And this is exactly what rattlesnakes see, for example. Don't forget the process. A lot of people in their exam answers forget to write this word and they lose marks. Next up, we're going to be focusing on the effector, which is the sweat gland. Now, sweat glands obviously produce sweat, which coats the surface of our skin. So let's assume our body's hot. What will happen is heat will be transferred from our body to the sweat, which you can see happening here. So the sweat gets hot. Now, as air rushes over the surface of our skin, it will take with it these water molecules. And these water molecules, as you can see, take the heat away with them, reducing our body temperature. You can relate this to when you're hot, you splash water on your face so the air cools you down as it blows against your face. So remember, sweat glands produce sweat, which encourages heat loss through evaporation. Always write the process, radiation, evaporation. Also, our heart rate increases. This is so that blood circulates around our body faster, so more heat is transferred through the process of radiation. So heat transfer rate increases. That's exactly why Charles Blagden's heart rate doubled. So three key effectors were vasodilation, where heat is lost through radiation, sweat glands producing sweat, which achieves heat loss through evaporation, and our heart rate increases, which increases the rate at which heat transfer occurs, either through radiation or evaporation. These effectors help bring about the response, which is a reduction in our body temperature back down to the optimum temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. In other words, negative feedback has been achieved. So now let's look at what happens when the stimulus is a drop in our body temperature below that lovely optimum 37 degrees Celsius. Like I said, the receptor again is the hypothalamus and skin, but it's the effectors that are most important. So this time, the opposite of vasodilation, which is called vasoconstriction. Think of constricting like a boa constrictor strangles but your blood vessel is being constricted. This reduces heat loss through radiation. So vasoconstriction means that these muscles in our blood vessels contract and that restricts blood flow to the surface of our skin. So there's a lower volume of blood flowing through our skin. That means less heat will be lost through radiation. This is why when you're cold, your skin has a paler color because all the blood is being retained near the core organs to keep your core systems warm and alive. Shivering is another response. This is when our muscles contract and relax rapidly. This increases their rate of respiration and respiration produces heat. So shivering increases the amount of heat released through respiration and can raise body temperature. The final effector are the erector muscles in your skin contract and this raises your body hairs. Now this is probably more useful than other mammals who have a great deal more body hair like you can see this response in cats quite commonly, although cats can do it to look intimidating too. So the idea behind this strategy is the hairs will trap air near the surface of the skin and the air acts as a wonderful insulator keeping heat in. So remember, those erector muscles contract and the hair is hoisted up, it raises up. And the response, of course, is our body temperature increases. So once again, we've achieved negative feedback. 
So there's a lot to take in there, so let's have a quick review. Firstly, stimulus, body temperature increases. Receptor, hypothalamus and skin detect the change. The effectors, vasodilation, that increases heat loss through radiation. Sweat glands produce sweat, so it increases heat loss through evaporation. And your heart rate increases, so the heat transfer rate increases. The result of all this is body temperature falls, so you get negative feedback correcting the initial change. Next, stimulus. Body temperature falls. Hypothalamus and skin, again the receptors that detect that change. The effectors, vasoconstriction, so less heat loss through radiation. Shivering, so more heat is released through respiration. And erector muscles in the skin contract. This raises the hair so you get more insulation. The result is body temperature increases, so once again we get negative feedback which reverses the initial change. And that is how you explain the negative feedback pathway for temperature control. So finally, why do we even need to control our body temperature anyway? So this is the importance of a constant body temperature. So if our body temperature rises, we can develop a condition called hypothermia. If this condition is sustained, eventually our body will lose the ability to actually control its own temperature and then you need immediate medical assistance. You may have heard of sunstroke, that is a form of hypothermia. Hypothermia can cause deliriousness, sickness, vomiting and general fatigue. But why is it a problem? Well, it's really to do with little proteins in your body that act a little bit like tiny micro-machines keeping you alive. These are called enzymes. And when these enzymes are destroyed, we say they have denatured. When our enzymes denature, we die. So this is an enzyme here. They aren't actually living. They just occur or are found inside living things. And this is the molecule which the enzyme acts upon. Now let's just assume this is a chemical reaction that is essential to our survival. So the enzyme must be able to lock onto this and break it down. So let's watch that in action. So the enzyme bonds with the substrate or the target molecule. The enzyme then assists in the breakdown of that molecule to form products. Okay, so that's what the enzyme needs to be able to do. But what happens when the enzyme is too hot? You can see the enzyme has completely changed shape, that's what we mean by denatured, and now it can no longer bind to that target molecule, so it can no longer perform that chemical reaction which we need to keep us alive. Interestingly enough, some poisons actually target enzymes to kill us, for example cyanide is such a poison. So on the flip side of that is when we get too cold and we develop a condition called hypothermia. Now again, if this is prolonged, we lose the ability to actually regulate our body temperature and we need immediate medical assistance. But why does this kill us? You see, certain chemical reactions require a certain amount of energy to keep operating at a set speed. So for example, let's say this is the normal speed at which this reaction occurs. So the enzyme bonds with the substrate, and the substrate is broken down very quickly to form products. So let's say now that our body temperature is well below that optimum 37 degrees. Now all the chemicals in our body will be moving at a slower rate. So this enzyme will basically take much longer to bond with that substrate and product formation takes much longer. And this is, may not seem like a big deal, but if things happen too slowly, then it just doesn't happen at a rate which keeps us alive. So with a decrease in body temperature, chemical reactions can occur too slowly to keep us alive. And that is why we must control body temperature.